Good morning, Central. It's great to see you today. Let's stand to our feet. Let's begin our service by giving all of our praise to our God this morning. He's worthy. Praise belongs to you. Let every kingdom bow. Let every ocean roar. Let every heart adore. Right now, we want you to take a minute to find somebody you haven't seen yet. Give them a little fist bump. No sickness. Say good morning. Well, good morning, everyone. Good to see you. You may be seated. 
I'd like to welcome you this morning to our second edition of our worship service today. For those of you that are visiting with us, uh, your guest here at Central, my name is Scott Carlson. I'm the lead pastor here, and it is our joy and privilege to have you worship with us today. Are you thankful for this beautiful weekend weather we've got? Compared to where it was a couple weeks ago, it is very nice. And I uh, want to welcome you this morning. So if you are not a member here at Central, thank you from the bottom of our hearts of coming and being a part of our service today. Following the service today, my wife and I are going to be out in the main foyer. We would love to get to know you and have you come out and uh, let us greet you. And we've got a small gift that we want to give to you for attending today. So please make certain that you stop out and see us so that we can pray with you and, and uh, just to get to know you better. I'm going to lead us in prayer, but as I do so, I'd like for us just to have a time of, uh, of uh, deep, uh, silent prayer as well. And, uh, well, we've been, as a church, we've been hit pretty hard the last couple of weeks with, uh, with death, with sickness, all sorts of stuff. And if you're like me, sometimes it's really easy just to rush into church and to do what we always do. And, I, and I'd, I'd like for us just to stop for a moment and just pause. And uh, let's make certain that we're aware of what, what we're about to do and what we've just done just a few minutes ago. And that is we enter into the presence of God, and as we do that, He deserves our best. He deserves our attention. He deserves our, our allegiance. He deserves our best worship possible. And, of course, you know, that word worship comes from a compound word that means worth and then ship, like a, like a boat. That, that's what the word worship means. And, and the idea of it is, is that, that we're sailing our, God's worth to Him in our words uh, and and uh, our, our our praise, and so let's let's take time right now. Let's just let's pause for a moment and let's just thank God for His goodness. So wherever you're sitting or standing, whether you're up on stage or whether you're in the sound booth or whether you're watching this by 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 Facebook or whether you're here in the sanctuary, I want you right now just give God thanks. Just wherever you're at, just say thank you, God. Thank you for life. Thank you for breath. Thank you for this very moment. Psalms 100 verse 4 tells us that we enter His gates and His courts with thanksgivings and with praises. So let's just right now tell Him what we're thankful for. We praise Him for who He is. We thank Him for what He's done. So, Lord, we've gathered in your presence to have one voice, to give worship to you, to give our best to you. God, we know that you gave your best to us on the cross. So may we be reminded, Lord, what this hour is about. I pray for those that know you as Savior, that their faith would only be reconfirmed in their heart today. And for those that do not know you, I pray that you would cause them today to to be drawn to yourself and that they might come to life and their life will never be the same again. Guide Ryland and our team as they lead us in worship. Guide me and my, my mouth, my lips as I give forth your word. And I pray, Lord, it would be evident today that it is your word, not mine, that is spoken today. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. And God's people said, amen. Let's stand together, church. Let's bless the name of the Lord this morning. <laughs> Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. Though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Every blessing, we give it back. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. 
story of our lives this morning. The gospel. We needed him. I needed rescue. My sin was heavy. The chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter. I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven.
God's people said it. Amen. You can be seated this morning. Thank you so much for worshiping with us through song today. And now we come to an extension of our worship time, our tithes and offerings portion of our service. And I'm going to ask if our ushers would go ahead and make their way to the front this morning. They're going to prepare to take up the offering, and you can prepare to give as well. I believe that giving is an even bigger part or an evidence of the worship that we bring to our God. How can we sing I Surrender All when we don't trust Him with the financial part of our life? I know that's hard sometimes, but uh, many of you have been so faithful over the years. Some of us are new and growing in this part of our faith, and we make it easy for you to give. So if you didn't come ready to give, you can still take part in worship as we do this. You can give online. You can give through our app. We even have texting available where you can give that way. If you're watching online with us on Facebook right now, you can give through text. Many of you do this. You already have it recurring set up, and we don't want it to just, uh, you to not be able to take part in the actual act of worship. So grab that card that's in the seat back in front of you that says, I gave online. Just put that in the plate as it goes by. Prayerfully place that in there that every penny that is given today would be used to bring glory to our God. Amen? All right, Brother Paul, our Deacon of the Week is going to come. He's going to pray right now. Let's pray. Father, I just want to thank you for this day, God. God, I thank you that it's just so awesome that we get to come and worship you, God, on, on, and just with other believers. And Father, I just uh, I pray and thank you for that. And Father, I just want to pray that um, this morning we've set aside this time, God, just to give back to you what you've already blessed us with. God, I pray that you would just take this uh, tithe and offering. I pray that you use it to your glory, God, and pray that it would help to further the kingdom, Father. Father, I just pray these things in your son's name. Amen. <clears throat> It's time for us to dismiss our kids to go to Children's Church. Ages four years old through kindergarten can be dismissed first out those doors over there. through third graders can be dismissed to go to Children's Church. Parents, if this is your child's first time to go to Children's Church, that younger group that we dismissed first is halfway down the hall when you pick them up. This older group will be all the way down at the end of the hall at what we call Kids Central. And since it's so nice, they'll probably be outside today when you pick them up. Um, you picked a good week to come if this is your first week here at CBC. This Pastor Scott is back after a little vacation in the sun. And uh, we're starting a new sermon series called Vision, uh, something about, what's the tagline? The Art of Seeing the Possibility. The Art of Seeing the Possibility. So let's give Scott a good warm welcome back home. Well, it is wonderful to be home. We uh, got to spend a couple of weeks down in sunny South Florida, and uh, when you guys were in the deep freeze back here, I think one time I checked the weather, and I think it was like 7 degrees back here. And i got to tell you, that 60 degrees that we were complaining about down in South Florida when we found out that you guys were at 5 or 6 degrees, all of a sudden seemed a lot warmer. And, uh, but we had a great time, and it's always great to be back home. 
I was reminiscing um, the other day, thinking back to the days that Sarah and I were in seminary. Uh, we uh, got married um, on July the 20th, 1985, and uh, uh, the next day we literally began the move uh, to Fort Worth, Texas to head to seminary back in the, in the mid-80s. And uh, it was during that time uh, we had been at seminary for about a year. I was working a job as a lunchroom monitor. Can you imagine that? And uh, my job was to keep the kids quiet so the teachers could eat and the, and the students would, would finish their food and found out that Sarah was expecting. And so uh, nine months later, uh, Sarah gave birth to our very firstborn. And uh, the day after that, I was hunting for a new job because I needed to uh, uh, be able to support our family a little better as we were uh, in the midst of uh, seminary studies. Uh, I, I went to, uh, down to the Fort Worth Transportation Company and applied for a job as a bus driver and uh, became a bus driver for the Fort Worth Transportation Company. And I got to tell you, it's one of the, 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 the most fun uh, part-time jobs I think I, I've ever had. Uh, the only problem was is that, that after I got hired, I had to go take an eye exam and I flunked it. And when I flunked it, I had to go get some new glasses. Now, there's a rumor going around that somebody by the initials of Rylan Russell put a picture of me up on Facebook uh, with uh, some, some specs that I know all of you guys are incredibly jealous about. I got that when I was in high school, uh, but, uh, but I got my real glasses when I was uh, uh, second year in seminary uh, school. Uh, and an amazing thing happened when I, when I brought those, put those new glasses on, those new specs. All of a sudden, the world became larger. The, the, the grass was greener, the, the trees were brighter, the uh, colors were more colorful, everything was bigger, everything was, was, was just better. Uh, and, and maybe you remember a time that, that you were halfway blind and got glasses, and then all of a sudden the world just became a, a better place to, to, to look at. Well, unfortunately, there's a lot of people today that, that uh, uh, their eyesight's fine when it comes to, to what they see. But as far as being able to look to the future, they have a very difficult time. Uh, maybe here this morning, you need a, a vision check. You, you need to be able to see things in a, in a brighter way. Uh, I think of what Chuck Swindoll said when he said, when I think of vision, I have in the mind the ability to see above and beyond the majority. And, and, and maybe you are that individual that you are so close to the a forest that the trees that are in front of you are blinding you of being able to see around the corner or to be able to even see the, the forest that's in, that's in front of you. And so starting today, we're, we're, gonna get, we're going to begin a brand new sermon series talking about our vision as a church. And of course, we've selected uh, maybe the most popular verse of Scripture found in the Bible that speaks about vision, and it's Proverbs 29, verse 18. So if you have your Bible, you might want to uh, turn to, to that uh, uh, verse and chapter. If not, if you're following along with your phone or, or you're on our sermon app, uh, you can uh, look at that and we'll look at that scripture here in, in just a moment. Helen Keller once said, the only thing worse than being blind is having sight but no vision. And that might be describing some of those of you that are here today because you see without vision, you can't see into the future. Without vision, you can't dream. Uh, my wife and I and, and uh, oldest grandson, Caden, uh, when we were in South Florida, one of the days that we, we went to the South Florida Science Museum and Aquarium, and right there, there was a quote by Albert Einstein that said that imagination is more powerful than knowledge. And I remember seeing that. And, uh, but without vision, you can't even imagine. Without vision... You can't see the possibilities. Without vision, you are stuck in the past. When you, uh, if you are without vision, you are uh, destined to repeat the same mistakes that you've done over and over again. Because you see, we all need vision. Solomon said the words ever so uh, correctly in Proverbs twenty nine eighteen, uh, when he says, "Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he." Now, it's, it's rare that I will preach out of the King James Version because I usually like to preach out of the New American Standard or the New Living Translation or uh, maybe even the NIV. But today, I selected the King James Version because this is the verse that many people that have followed Christ for many years are familiar with this passage because it just reads so eloquently where there is no vision, you know. Uh, so, so that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to take this passage of Scripture and we're going to basically ask the question, what does the word vision mean? Then we're going to talk about what does it mean to perish, and then we're going to talk about what does it mean to truly keep the law. 
Uh, not long ago, our church adopted a document of, of, uh, of statements. We, we adopted a new mission uh, vision statement or a new mission statement, a new vision statement. We adopted seven core values, and we adopted a process statement. And uh, many of you are familiar with that. For example, if I were to ask you what's the purpose of Central Baptist Church, you would immediately say what? The purpose of Central Baptist Church is to live for Christ, to love people, and to make disciples. And, and you would say that correct. Uh, the question that I ask you is, though, is that mission statement, is that purpose statement, is that biblical? Because if it's not biblical, then we need to throw it out because it's not worth the paper that it's written upon. And we'll, we'll talk more a little bit later about what that means. But today we're going to talk, we're going to begin the series talking about what does our vision statement mean. Now, our purpose statement is our job description, okay? How many of you have a job description of the place that you, you work at? Any of you? Teenagers, here's your job description. Obey your mother and father, all right? So there, there's your job description. And I don't see any of our teenagers excited to hear me give that uh, job description. But that's, a, that's what our job description is of, of what we're supposed to do, plain and simple. But our vision statement, that's a little different. Our vision statement speaks out into the future of what we hope to become. We admit we're not there now, but, but our desire is, is a someday to be a people of four things. We want to be a people of acceptance. We want to be a people of healing. We want to be a people of equipping. And we want to be a people of sending. And the reason that we have this as our, as our vision statement is quite simply is, is that I believe God gave that to us. I remember the very day that I was with our, our master plan team. They were in this very sanctuary. We were spread across the entire sanctuary praying. Many people were on their knees up here in the, at, the, at the altar. Others were in the different parts of the sanctuary. And I was sitting about the fourth row, four, about the fourth row back, right in the middle over here. And it was during that time that, that this, this uh, vision statement kept coming in my mind as far as what type of pastor that I want to be, what type of people do I desire our people to be. And it's this whole idea of being a, a people of acceptance, of healing, of equipping and sending. And then as I think about it, it it goes all the way back to my salvation experience. When I came to Christ as Savior, Jesus accepted me long before that uh, He began to deal with me about all the different messed up nut things that were going on in my life. He accepted me for who I was. He dealt with my sin, no doubt. He did that on the cross even before He saved me. But it was at my salvation that He brought me into His family. He brought acceptance to me, and then He brought healing to me. And then He began to equip me to do the work that God had called me to do. And then He sent me to do that work. And so, so this is our, our vision statement. And over the next four months, we're going to literally be camping out on this vision statement. Now, I don't know about you. I think that, that what I say about you will be, is, is, is also the same with me, but I have to speculate because I don't know exactly where you are at in life right now, but I can tell you that I want, with all of my heart, whether I'm doing a good job at it or not is irrelevant, but my desire is that I want to make a difference. I, I, want, I want to leave behind something for my children and grandchildren, and I'm not talking about a monetary inheritance because Sarah and I plan on spending every single penny. And uh, but I tell our kids, you know, if you get something, it's a bonus. But uh, but but we want to make it. We want to make a difference. Now, when you guys were in your deep freeze and we were in South Florida, it was. Just, I think it was. To be honest with you, I think it was only us and the Canadians that went to the beach that that those couple of weeks because the the sun wasn't shining that much. There were a couple of days we got sunshine, but a lot of times it was cloudy. It was kind of cool. It was in in the 60s a lot. Uh, but uh, one of the things that we did every day we went to the beach and we took our grandkids is we made sandcastles. How many of you love to make sandcastles? Anybody? Really? Just a couple of people? I love making sandcastles because it really doesn't take that much to, I mean, if you got a bucket, you can make a sandcastle. And so that's what we did with our, with our buckets. We made sandcastles. And so my job was to make sandcastles. Caden and Jonathan's job was what? To destroy it immediately, you know. And so I, I made a castle. They destroyed it. I made another castle. And finally I said, no, let me make a few castles first because I wanted to make a big moat. And all of a sudden I found out I was a troll, to be quite honest with you, because I, I was making this castle and they were coming over to destroy it. I was like, thou shalt not pass. I mean, stay away from my sandcastle. But, but, but I discovered that, that no matter how many sandcastles I made and no matter how beautiful they were and no matter how strong they were, that they would be destroyed within minutes of, of, of four little hands and, and four little feet getting all over the sandcastle. That's not the type 
that's not the difference that I want to make in life. I don't want to, you know, to be a popular pastor where people like me only for people to, to forget what, we, what we've done together. And, and so, so my desire is, is that I want to make a difference. I want to leave behind a legacy. I, I want to make a difference in people's lives, and I think you do as well. And that's really what this whole idea of this purpose uh, vision statement that we're going to be talking about over the next few weeks. Now, I did a little bit of digging into the Scripture this week, and, and I got out as many different uh, uh, Bible translations that I could find, and I wanted to see what the different versions, how they interpreted uh, Proverbs 29 and 18 as well. And so let me read to you from a few different versions. Out of the New International Version of Scripture, it says this. It says, Where there is no revelation, people cast off restraint. But blessed is the one who heeds wisdom's instruction. In the New American Standard Version, which is the, probably my favorite uh, version of Scripture, it is the most literal uh, wooden uh, Scripture that's out there, or, or interpretation, I should say. A little more difficult to understand, uh, but, but if you really want a good translation that is that is in my opinion, the closest to the, to, the, to the New Testament and Old Testament, the New American Standard is, is, is your version. It says this, Where there is no vision, the people are unrestrained, but happy is he who keeps the law. And then it tells us in the, in the Holman Christian Standard Bible, which is our own Baptist Bible, I guess some could say, that was put out by our convention, said, Without revelation, people run wild, but the one who listens to instruction or the one who, who uh, uh, but one who listens to instruction will be happy. The New Living Translation, which I think is Rev. Kev's favorite, I think he told me he loves to read out of the New Living Translation, says this, When people do not accept divine guidance, they run wild, but whoever obeys the law is joyful. A great translation. And then the New Century Version says this, it says, Where there is no word from God, people are uncontrolled, but those who obey what they have been taught, are happy. This one single verse we will use as a platform or as a diving board to dive into to this series. During the month of February, we're going to talk about what it means to be a church of acceptance. During the month of March, we're going to talk about what does it mean to be a church of healing. And then the next month, we'll talk about what it means to, to be a church of equipping. And then finally, we'll talk about what does it mean to be a church of sending. And so, so this is going to, in a nutshell, what we're going to be talking about over the next several, several weeks, several months. So let, let's draw out three profound truths just from the Scripture itself. And what is our Scripture? Let's go back to the King James Version, if you don't mind, the very first one that we put out there, uh, where there is no vision, the people perish. Matter of fact, let, let's just read this together out loud. Let's say it together. One, two, three. Where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keepeth the law happy is he. Let's divide this into three points. Number one, the word must be prominent. The word must be prominent. The very first thing that he says here is that where there is no vision. So God's word must be prominent. It must be prominent in our church. It must be prominent behind this pulpit. It must be prominent in the music that we sing. It must be prominent uh, in our Sunday school classes, it, but it also must be prominent in your home. It must be prominent at your work. It must be prominent at your school. It must be prominent in how you live your life, how you spend your money, how you raise your children, how you live your life. The Word of God must be prominent because the Scripture tells us where there is no vision. Now, the King James translation, vision means revelation. And, that, and that's, a, that's a, a good translation, a good understanding of what it is. And so when we talk about vision, we're not necessarily talking about what is your vision for the church. I get asked that question a lot. You know, Scott, what's your vision for the church? What's your vision for the future? Well, my vision needs to be equal to the vision of the Word of God because it is God's revelation. It is His Word that, 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 uh, that Solomon is talking about. So here's the idea behind Proverbs 29, 18. Where there is no revelation of God's will, the people perish. Where God's teachings are silent or absent, that's where the people perish, is what he's saying. When God's prophecies have gone silent, that's where the people perish. Not just at the church, but at home and everywhere. Now, in the Old Testament, we know the primary way that God spoke to the people uh, was uh, through the, the speaking of the, the, the prophets. The prophets would speak about the law, the prophets would speak about the future, but the prophets also would speak just about, about everyday living. And that's how a lot of the, the, the books in the Old Testament got written, 
uh, was because the prophets were prophesying God's Word, and then they would write it down, and uh, that's how they lived. Now, in the New Testament, we are blessed to have what? God's Word, the Bible, you know, the B-I-B-L-E. Now, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the Word of God, the B-I... Don't you just want to break out and sing it right now? I'm ready for Bible school already. And... Uh, but it's the Bible, we are, we are blessed to have the Scripture today. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says this. It says, all Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God, that's you and that's me, may be adequate, equipped in every decent work, for every decent work. So our purpose and vision statement Better be scriptural. Let's, let's put our, our purpose statement to the test just for a second. If the purpose of Central Baptist Church is to live for Christ, love people, and make disciples, let's just ask ourselves, how biblical is that? The first part is to live for Christ. Is, is that biblical? Sure it is. Uh, the great commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You know, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, that's living for Christ, Right? To, for me to live for Christ, to die is a gain. That's living for Christ, right? Okay, let's talk about the second part. Love people. Is that biblical? Well, yeah. That, that's, that's not take, to take a rocket scientist to figure out that's, that's biblical. The Bible says love your neighbor as yourself. Love your enemies, right? And so, so the second part, to love people, is very biblical. What about the third part? We want to live for Christ. We want to love people, and we want to make disciples. Is that biblical? Sure it is. The Great Commission. Go into all the world and do what? Make disciples. And so, so very biblical. So the question that now we ask ourselves is, what about our vision statement? How biblical is it? So starting next week, during the whole month of February, we're going to talk about how many times Jesus accepted people for who they were and, and, and where they were. You're going to be surprised, however, to discover that it was the religious people that Jesus rejected it wasn't the, the people that were outside of what we would call the church today. Uh, they were the ones that, that he accepted and brought into his family. So we'll, we'll talk more about that starting uh, next week. But, but I have to ask you this question before we get to that. What role does the Bible play in your life? If it is simply a book that we occasionally dust off and that we open up on our Bible app on a Sunday morning, I mean, I'm thankful that you do that, but if that's the only time that we really acquaint ourselves with the Word of God, we are in a whole mess of trouble. And so, so the question I've got to ask you is, is this question, do you, do you believe the Word of God? Number two, do you read regularly the Word of God? Number three, do you study the Word of God? In other words, do you, do you go beyond simply reading an, an occasional scripture? Do you memorize the Word of God? Do you meditate upon the Word of God? Do you search out His eternal truth? And, I, and I'm telling you, there are some of you that are listening to this right now, and, and, and you are, you're being gut-level honest. You're, you're saying, do I study it? Do I memorize it? Do, do, I, do I seek after it with all of my heart? I mean, I'm, I'm lucky to listen to it. I was talking to, uh, I remember this conversation that I had many, many years ago in one of my first churches that I was a minister at. It was one of those conversations that you just can't forget. I was talking to a young lady about reading the Bible, and she just flat out said, she said, Scott, I don't read the Bible. And I asked her, I said, well, why, why don't you read the Bible? She said, I, it makes me feel bad when I read the Bible. She said, when I read the Bible, it just tells me of all the, make, reminds me of the bad person that I, that, I, that I am. And when I read the Bible, it guilts me. When I read the Bible, it, it, it reminds me of how, you know, many things that I don't do that God wants me to do. And so I just, I just don't read the Bible. I wanted, and I, did, I, I should have done this, but what I should have done, I should have stood up and I should have applauded her, and I should have said, bravo, bravo, because at least this lady was being honest with me at that particular moment. And I, I would suggest to you here today that, that if you don't live for God, you're not going to enjoy reading the Bible. You're really not. Not if you're reading it for what it's, what it's supposed to be there for, because the Bible indeed will bring conviction to you. But I will also say to you that if you read the Bible and with all of your heart and you search after it, it's going to unlock uh, things that are, are amazing in your life. In other words, you know, look, just to kind of give you an example, you're looking for some marriage advice, guess what? It's in the book. 
You're looking for some advice on relationships. You want to look on some for uh, dating about how to find a mate. Guess what? It's in the book. You struggle with your finances. Guess what? It's in the book. You struggle with uh, uh, grief and with sadness. Guess what? It's in the book. Is your mind in a death spiral of negative thinking? Guess what? It's in the book. You feel alone and afraid. We've all felt that. Guess what? It's in the book. Does sin enslave you and hold you, you know, captive? Guess what? The answer is in the book. You name it, and it's in the book. And I challenge you, you know, uh, to do an honest search of the Word of God. And there are more tools that are now available than ever before on any subject that you're going through in life. The answer is found in the book. I was talking to uh, a person the other day that went to a church that... uh, um, well, let's just say that it was it, the church was dying, and uh, I could give you a lot of reasons of why I think that this one particular church is dying, or why the people think they were dying. But they, but he would say that every Sunday his pastor would lift up the Bible, and he would point to it, and he would say, "I love this book." And you would think that in any Bible believing church, that a pastor would get up and say that that the people would would enjoy that, right? I mean, Brother David, if I say, I love this book, you're probably going to say, amen. That's right. (laughs) And you'd say, well, you should because you're the pastor, right? So why is this one church dying? That that every Sunday the pastor gets up and he says, I love this book. Anybody want to take a guess why this church might might be dying? Because he's lying (laughs) when he says, I love the book, but, but maybe he doesn't really love it. Or maybe, what's that? Maybe the church doesn't love the book, maybe. Or maybe it's because he loves two pieces of leather with some paper inside of it, but he doesn't love the one that wrote the book. Is that possible that you can love knowledge to the point that you forget to love the Savior behind the knowledge? Yeah. Second thing that I find in the Scripture, where there is no vision, where there is no biblical revelation, the Bible says, the people perish. According to Solomon, without God's Word directing us, we will meet our end. Perish means to run wild. It means to cast off restraint. It means to become ungovernable. It means to, that it cannot be reined in. And here's the idea. Without God's revelation to guide us, there is nothing man can't do. There is nothing man won't do. Have you ever been appalled at someone else's sin? And this is yes, by the way. And this is no. You ever been appalled at someone else's sin? And what I mean appalled by it, I mean, I mean like, I can't believe that they would do that. I, mean, I, just, I, just, I just can't believe that they could stoop so low that they could do that horrible, horrible sin. By the way, you got to be careful before you get too far down the road because, you see, I believe the Bible teaches that there is no sin man cannot do. There is no sin that man will not do. There is no sin that you and I are not possible of doing if we separate ourselves from the Word of God. That's what he's saying here. Peter Marshall said, give us clear vision that we may know where to stand and what to stand for, because unless we stand for something, we shall fall for everything. Without a clear path from God's Word, we are doomed to repeat history over and over again. I keep hearing people talk about the good old days, you know, about when, when and listen, I, I, I've been guilty of this myself, but can I tell you that history basically for the last well, for the last 6,000 years, for as long as Adam and Eve had been on the earth, has repeated itself over and over and over and over again. That we're, you know, I don't believe, you know, I can't believe I'm actually going to say this, but I don't, I don't believe that uh, back in the good old days, whenever the good old days were, you know, that we were any less sinful then than we are today. Because sin is sin. And as, long, as, as long as there's people on this earth, there will always be sin. And after Adam and Eve got kicked out of the garden, sin entered this world, and or actually got sin entered the world while they were in the garden, but, but they were cast out. I mean, I want you to think just for a moment about the biblical examples of when there was absent of God's Word, 
on this land about how sinful things got. Let's go all the way back to Moses just for a second. Okay, love Moses. Remember how Moses led the children of Israel out of, out of Egypt, and, and there one day uh, God speaks to Moses, and, and Moses and God speaks to the people. And do you remember that, that passage in, in, uh, in Exodus where it scared the people so much? I mean, I, this is almost comical. It scared the people so much that the people gathered together and said, Hey, Moses, uh, we don't really like talking to God because He's scary. And so we would rather you go up to the mountain and you talk to God, and when God speaks to you, then you come down and you tell us. Because we're, you know, was that last experience that we had when we talked with God, you know, it was kind of, kind of fearful. And so that's what happened. And you remember what happened in, in, in Exodus where Moses would, would, would lead the children of Israel down in the, in the valley, and he'd go up to the mountain, he'd talk to God, and uh, he'd spent several, several days up there. And when he came back down, he discovered that the children of Israel were having a party. And what were they doing? You remember? They had built, what? A golden calf. And what were they doing with that golden calf? They were worshiping the golden calf. I mean, they were having a party, but it wasn't a good party. And, uh, and, but, but just, just the, the Word of God had been absent just for a few short days, and all of a sudden the people were committing the very sin that God told them not, not, to, not, to, not to do. Consider Eli's sons for a moment. Remember the story of Samuel? Love the story of Samuel, how God spoke to Samuel. But the Scripture tells us in 1 Samuel 3 that the Word of God had been absent during those days. And who was the priest? It was Eli. And, and, and Eli had two sons, and they were sons of priests, and they were supposed to be leading the, the people of God. But the Bible says that they did not know God. And if you know anything about Eli's sons, they were bad dudes, and they got killed as a result of their irreverence. And, and so, so I could give you example after example after example of times that when the, when the Word of God was silent about what man did, and um, it would floor you. The most interesting thing that I find about Proverbs 29, 18 is that to my knowledge in, in the book of Proverbs, this is the only time that it speaks about prophets giving forth the Word of God. In the book of Proverbs, time and time again, do you know who the main, respons- the, the main person or the people that were responsible for teaching the Word of God? Anybody want to take a guess? Think about the relationship that the author, Solomon, had with his dad and with his sons. It wasn't speaking mostly to prophets or to preachers, but to moms and dads and teachers. What that tells me is any church that puts the full responsibility upon its youth pastor and children's director to teach the children is a church that has their head buried in the sand. Because it is, yes, their job is to help lead us. Their job is to lead us, you know, to, to minister to, to our teenagers and to our, to our kids. But this is where it starts, mom and dad. It starts at home. It starts at home. It starts at home. It starts at home. That's where it starts of teaching our children. You say, I'm not qualified. Who is qualified to teach the Word of God? But the, but the believer in Christ. Uh, Isaiah 55 verse 8 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways. And what he, what he means by that is that apart from the Word of God, our ways are always corrupt. And that's why man's way will always lead to destruction unless it is governed by the Word of God. Third, and we close with this thought. Blessings come through compliance. But he who keepeth the law, happy is he. It's not enough to know the word. His word is to be obeyed. The law, the Torah, is not merely the written Mosaic law, but it's the announcement of God's will by the mouth of his representative. But here's the thought. Solomon is not necessarily talking just about blessed is the one who simply obeys the truth. But he's comparing this to two groups of people. One, a group of people that uh, are like a lawless people, those who are not influenced by the Word of God, and those that are divinely influenced by divine guidance. Happy is he, blessed is he, who hears God's voice and obeys. Remember how the people knew whether Moses had spoken to God or not? How'd they know? 
Moses would come down off the mountain and he glowed. He glowed. The Shekinah glory was so bright upon God or upon God's servant that the people knew. Now, I know that I have uh, been the pastor here for a long time. I know that. You know how I know that? Because the first service, I had three or four people say, Boy, Pastor, you gained some weight on your vacation. <laughs> and I had a few of them say, Well, where's the suntan? You know, that basically, they were making, telling me I was pale and fat. That's what basically a few people were telling me. But, you know, you got to love an honest church, right? It's all right. I call some of them crusty today in the first service. I didn't call you crusty because none of you insulted me that way, but I call some of them crusty in the first service. What does it mean to obey God's Word? The problem is that I see today is that most people do not, well, let me just say it this way. Most people do what they want to do with zero regard to what God says. I don't know why it is, but over the last five years, I've heard the following statement more than I think I have... uh, that I've heard in the last 30 years uh, of my ministry. But I have heard probably at least a dozen times in the last five years people coming up to me and they say, well, you know, Pastor, you and I, you know, uh, we we might agree to disagree, but God and I, we have a special arrangement. What does that mean? What does that mean? God and I have a special arrangement. You mean God's going to be okay with the sin that you commit? God's going to be okay with the adultery that, 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 that you're involved in? God's going to be okay with you destroying your body? God's going to be okay with, with you just flippantly doing what you want to do, and at the very end, God's going to wink and let you into heaven? I mean, is that, is that what you mean, that you and God have a special arrangement? Let me tell you about the special arrangement that God made for you and I. He looked down, and He saw sin upon you and I. He saw sin upon us, and we were vile to look at. And God had a, 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 is holy, and He can't mess with sin, and so, so, so God had to put His complete wrath, not upon you, but He had to take a volunteer from heaven, and that volunteer just happened to be His only son. And he took his only son and he laid upon his son the wrath of Almighty God so that you and I might be spared of, of, of a devil's hell. Let me tell you, that's the special arrangement that God has made. God doesn't have a special arrangement with you. He has a special arrangement with his son of what he did for you and for me. And so the question that we've got to ask ourselves is how serious do we take sin? You say, well, what's this got to do with vision? It's got everything to do with vision. Because you can't see clearly when you're involved in something that is unholy. And I'm not the one who gets to tell you what sin is. That's in the Word of God. That's, that's not my job. My, my, my job is to preach the truth and to allow the Spirit of God to bring conviction to you and then to ask you to do the very same thing that God asked me to do every single day, and that is to get up, repent of my sin, and to, and to live my life for God on that day because it's the only day that I've got. So this is, this is how I want to close our, our time together uh, this morning. And here's the application point, real simple. I want you to think about one thing, just one thing, not, not 10, not 20, you know, but I want you to think about one thing that God has spoken to you in the past that you're either not doing um, or you're doing and He tells you not to do it. I mean, this could be a sin of omission or a sin of commission. One, one is basically something that you're doing that God says, stop doing it. That, 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 that is sin, you know, but, but it's also a sin when God tells you to do something that you don't do. And so I just want you to think about one thing, and for some of you, this is going to be really easy, because this one thing is on your mind all the time, all the time. And I don't even have to preach it to make you feel guilty about it, because you're always feeling guilty <laughs> that you haven't either given your finances to God, or you won't share your faith with God, or you won't you know, give your body to God or whatever it is, you know, your, your, your mind, uh, whatever it is. But I want you to think about one thing, just one thing that God has told you to quit doing or He's told you to do something. And, and let me just say this, quitting something is incredibly difficult to do unless you replace it with something. Okay, so just for me to say to you, hey, you need to stop telling dirty jokes. That's going to be next impossible unless you start telling clean jokes. Unless you start replacing that bad habit with something good. You can't just, let, your mind is, is, is a very powerful thing and you're going to always be thinking about something, but, but oftentimes you need to replace that with that, with something. 
So there's the assignment for you, you to do today that you can focus on this week. One thing. And find a way to be obedient in that one thing. A little song that I taught uh, our grandson, Caden, and he knows the words, whether he sings them or not, he knows the words. And it goes like this, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy with Popo. And then we stop, and then I repeat it, to be happy with Jesus, but to trust and obey. Because you see, blessings come through compliance. I know it sounds opposite. Ryland did this earlier in our first service today, but you want life, you got to die. Bob Dylan used to say, everybody's got to serve somebody. You know, he's right. Everybody's going to serve somebody. And so you serve yourself, you serve the enemy, which is one of the same, or you serve the Lord. What about you? Would you bow your head with me, please? Do you love this book? Do you know the one who wrote the book? Do you know the Savior? Does the Savior know you? If the answer is no, then how about today? Give your life to Him. We have counselors and ministers that are going to stick behind the service today and they want to talk with you and my encouragement to you is do not leave this place today without knowing who your Savior is and today could be the greatest day of your life Father in the name of Jesus I pray you would do the work that only you can do that is awaken the soul of a lost dead person draw them to yourself and let life enter their soul today. For those, Lord, that proclaim to know you as Savior, but they find themselves captured by sin again, set them free again today. I pray your work would be done and you would be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. My wife and I are going to be out in the foyer. We would love to talk with you, uh, especially if our guests come up and introduce yourself to us and let us uh, get to know you a little bit better. Our ministers over here on the side that if you need to talk to one of them to, to pray with or if a decision you need to make, please stop by and see them. Rylan? Aren't you glad you came to church today? Amen? Amen. Yeah, it's a good day. Uh, we're going to be dismissed now. Let's all stand to our feet, and we'll say our purpose statement one last time as we remind ourselves what we're supposed to be doing when we leave this place, let's say it loud together. Central Baptist Church, we exist to? Christ, love people, and make You're getting better every week. All right, see you later. Have a good week.